Um, well, first of all, uh, thanks as always to Petar and, uh, and to Tomislav and to Mariana uh, for, for helping with the, the organization of the conference. Um, and it's, it's always a real pleasure to return to MAMA. Um, so one other note about, about the schedule for the weekend before I get started with the introduction. So uh, unfortunately, we've had a cancellation from uh, Laren Dolar. Um, but you'll see that we have this little leaflet with the schedule for the, of the talks for the weekend. And of course, as soon as you make something like this, everything immediately changes. <laughs> and, then it's, uh, and then it's more or less worthless. But it's not entirely worthless because it has the times of the different lectures. Um, so some of the, the speakers have shifted around. We're going to be joined by Alexander Garcia Dutman, um, who will, will give a paper uh, tomorrow evening. Um, and then Ray Brazier's talk will be shifted to Sunday evening. Um, but other than that, everything uh, is the same on the, on the schedule. So we start today with four papers. Um, and then on Saturday and Sunday, we have two papers each day with a round, uh, round table in the evening. Um, and uh, the introduction that I'll give right now, um, as usual for the past few years, uh, actually is about a film. I guess I've been speaking about film by chance for the last few years for my introductions, and there are always detours at which we eventually arrive at the, at the topic. So that's how this introduction um, will work today. So thanks everyone uh, for joining us, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to a fantastic weekend of, of talks. So the introduction actually it has a title. It's called The Angler or the Sophist, um, which is a little, it's a question um, from, from Plato's dialogue, Sophist. So there's a gesture in a short film by uh, Eric Romer, the bakery girl of Monceau, that I think is among the keys to his great sequence of films, The Six Moral Tales. It's also a gesture that I think, or that I hope, will touch upon our topic this weekend. The scenario of the film is as follows. It's a short film, about 20 minutes. A young law student becomes infatuated with a woman that he often passes on the street, Sylvie, eventually inviting her for coffee. She agrees to meet with him sometime soon, but then she disappears. The protagonist is left wandering the streets of his neighborhood in spare moments between studying for his exams, hoping to encounter her again. Surrendering his regular mealtime to the search, he falls into the habit of stopping by a local bakery where he buys sugar cookies. First one, then two, then eventually five or six pastries at a time, devouring them absentmindedly outside on the street. In the absence of Sylvie, he initiates a gradually escalating flirtation with the girl behind the counter at the bakery, eventually asking her out for dinner and a movie. Then just before the appointed hour of their date, Sylvie reappears walking with a cane just outside the bakery. Her disappearance was due to a sprained ankle. And after our protagonist decides on the spot to abandon his date in order to have dinner with Sylvie instead, he learns that she had been observing his dalliance with the bakery girl and his insatiable appetite for pastries from the windows of an apartment just across the street. I know all of your vices, she tells him, and they are married six months later. So the film depicts the opening of an interval and its closure, a meaningless interlude in which the protagonist strolls aimlessly, flirts to assuage his boredom, placates his sweet tooth with factory-made cookies. The particular gesture that I'm interested in involves one of his vices, littering. After eating his pastries, the protagonist habitually tosses aside their wax paper wrappers, first into a storm drain, then into the gutter, and later onto the street. And this little gesture strikes me as somehow emblematic of Romero's moral investigations. Interestingly, it only appears in the film, not in the written version of the tales that Romero first composed. When he drops the bakery girl for Sylvie, the protagonist describes his choice as a moral decision. Having found Sylvie again, he judges to have carried on with the bakery girl would have been worse than a vice. It would have been pure nonsense. But when he drops a rapper on the street during his meaningless interlude, it is precisely pure nonsense that the gesture embodies, perfectly careless, thoughtless, irrelevant, a visual sign of an insignificant hypothetical, a gesture performed as if nothing had happened. Neither demonstrative nor furtive, neither brazen nor guilty, he simply drops the wrapper and moves on, brushing the crumbs off his fingers with a handkerchief. Pure nonsense. 
It is as though the interlude that Sylvie's disappearance opens in Romero's film also opens an excluded middle within which the principle of non-contradiction is subject to violation. Once Sylvie returns, either the protagonist is with her or he is not. And if he is, then, car and if he is, then carrying on with another woman simply makes no sense. His moral decision follows the ethical premise that he cannot have it both ways. He cannot have his cake and eat it too. But during Sylvie's disappearance, we inhabit the realm of the exception, wherein she both is and is not. The protagonist grants that it's equally possible that she is either dead or on vacation. And wherein a flirtation with the bakery girl entails neither fidelity nor infidelity. Rather, it entails nothing. The realm of the exception is a world of semblance, in which the protagonist seems to be infatuated with the bakery girl, though he is not. Or perhaps he actually is, though it seems to him as though he is not. His interval inhabits the world also of exchange, where coins are traded for sweets and where meaningless speech, idle chatter, mediates the social relation, along with the chiming of the cash register. This world of semblance of the excluded middle of living contradiction and of social circulation that is at once meaningless and freighted with ambivalent value is the normal moral world of the moral tales. It's a world in which, for example, there are precise circumstances under which it suddenly becomes possible for a middle-aged man to stroke the bare knee of a teenager he has been lusting after, without this gesture registering as explicitly sexual. Romero's art in the fourth film of the moral tales, Claire's Knee, is to construct a scenario in which it just so happens, by chance, that this gesture is at once perfectly innocent and also scandalously erotic, in which the ambiguous territory of the knee becoming the very space of exception upon the otherwise untouchable leg of a young girl can at once fulfill and displace an impossible obsession. Of course, in The Bakery Girl of Monceau, ah, hi, Alberto, it's nice to see you. So, uh, of course, in The Bakery Girl of Monceau, the world of semblance, of the exception, will be repressed at the moment the proper object of desire re-enters the scene. Morality, good sense, reasserts its claim upon the social relation. Absence becomes presence. Nonsense is displaced by meaning. Artifice becomes authenticity. Indifference becomes devotion. Aimless seduction turns into true courtship. Idle chatter gives way to marriage vows. But in the meantime, the protagonist eats pastries and drops their wrappers on the street. Like an emblem of the simulacra, a pure surface wrapped around a sweet nothing, the wax paper peeled from a pile of identical sheets is nonsense itself. The disposable remainder, remainder of an artifice, a concoction, the what is that remains of what is now not, crumpled into a ball and cast aside without a thought, a discarded token of indifference. Well. By indirections, we are beginning to approach the figure of the sophist, especially the one evoked by Plato in his dialogue of that name. But actually, Romer's protagonist has more in common with the figure of the angler, defined at the beginning of Plato's text. Like the sophist, the angler is an expert in acquisition, in taking possession by hunting. But rather than hunting for the money of impressionable young men by trading in meaningless words, the angler gets his hook into the mouth of his prey by dangling it beneath a fish and waiting for it to take the bait. Our pastry eater is a kind of unknowing angler, casting about on the street below his quarry's apartment, fishing for a girl he doesn't want until he happens to hook the one he does, the better catch. But the power of Plato's dialogue is not contained in the definitions it arrives out for the angler at the beginning or for the sophist at the end. Rather, the profundity of the dialogue lies in its treatment of the sophist's ethical comportment as an ontological problem. The sophist's way of being, his curious way of speaking while saying nothing, bears upon the problem of being per se. More precisely, the sophist's capacity to bring what only seems to be into being makes manifest the difficulty of properly distinguishing that which is not from that which is. The sophist is an expert in a single field, disputation. But what the Eliadic stranger considers amazing is the sophist's capacity to appear as though he has knowledge of everything while having no such knowledge in truth. Though he is initially defined as an expert at acquisition, the sophist turns out to be skilled in production, 
producing spoken copies of everything and putting words into his listeners' ears that convey the appearance of truth. The sophist, quote, slips down somewhere into the craft of imitation, Plato writes, and the stranger follows him down into this murky territory, and as he does, he becomes a kind of angler himself, trying to catch the sophist and draw him back to the surface. Um, but the sophist is, Plato says, the stranger says, an impossibly confusing type, an amazing man who is very hard to make out. The problem is that appearing, the seeming but not being, by saying things but not true things, draws the angler himself down under the water, leading his own discourse into the depths where speaking of what is not entails making it that which is. The special adaptation of the sophist is not only his facility with the art of imitation, but in fact a kind of reverse mimicry, whereby anyone who wants to make him out has to become what he is, or so it seems, because the effort to say true things about the false involves one as though passing through an inverted reflection in the same obscurity as entailed by saying false things about the true. You're terrible, says Sylvie to the protagonist of Romero's film. You almost made me feel guilty. He had been looking for her, but by watching him, she is drawn into the world of his vices, and it is now vice rather than virtue that seals the compact between them. Hunting the sophist forces one to acknowledge that, quote, that which is not is, since otherwise falsity wouldn't come into being. It involves one in the seeming contradiction entailed by the being of non-being, and the problem is then to distinguish appearances from reality such that this contradiction can be resolved or at least controlled, contained by the category of seeming, such that it does not contaminate being qua being. But speech is a leaky vessel, and even to say that which is not is to make it be by assigning it the numerical quantity of one or by assigning it plurality if we say those which are not. And this is what the Eliatic stranger finds when he tries to counter discourse with truth. We do not say what we mean, Hegel tells us, but as we see, language is the more truthful, even if and precisely because, quote from Hegel again, in language we immediately refute what we mean to say. It's impossible, the stranger has to admit, to say, speak, or think that which is not, because one is forced to say mutually contrary things about it. He who fishes for the sophist in his element, language, ends up falling out of the boat and into the sea of contradiction. One wonders if this is what in fact happens to Sylvie in Romer's film. Uh, and it turns out that she is perhaps an angler caught with her own hook, falling for a cad by observing his vices too closely and thereby coming down to his level. Does the interval end in the film or does it continue? Are its parentheses closed or open? It's this opening of an apparently discrete interval that Deleuze, I think, identifies with what he calls the powers of the false. If the false is an exception to the regime of the true, it is nevertheless an exception with the power to impose its own rule. The strictly singular instance is in fact what repeats, and it is the dissemination of singularities that displaces the distinction between model and copy. According to the Eliotic stranger, the sophist is an expert at cheating and falsehood making. But if the rules of being turn out to be those of non-being, of the negative, as Hegel also understood, then the cheater who obeys the rule of the false turns out to be the very paragon of authenticity. This non of non-being runs through the history of philosophy precisely as a kind of prefix, always already having fixed the language game of truth-telling for any discourse that would speak being. Non-philosophy says as much, but so do Hegel and Deleuze in their own way. And indeed, Hegel shows that even Spinoza is subject to his own rule, omni determinatio est negatio, insofar as he has to determine substance by thinking it, thereby infecting it with the negative precisely through this, the discursive norms governing rational ontology. It is Barbara Cassin to whom we are indebted for the most direct confrontation with this problem, and especially to her major book, Le Fait Sophistique, which begins to trace what she calls a sophistical history of philosophy 
from the pre-Socratics to Lacan, Deleuze, and Derrida. But one wonders if this topic is not equally explicit, or at least explicitly implicit, in the work of all our keynote speakers this weekend, given that, the, given that books by Alberto Toscano, Ray Brazier, and Alexander Garcia Dutman bear such titles as The Theater of Production, or Nihil Unbound, or Philosophy of Exaggeration. The ontological production of that which is not is manifestly at stake in each of their philosophical itineraries, though far from identically so. And we are also lucky uh, to have four speakers for this first day of the symposium, Sami Khatib, Tsu Chan To, Julie Beth Napolin, and Alexei Kukuyevich, whose interests include such topics as Benjamin's destructive character, the structure of logical and mathematical reasoning, the relevance of non-semantic sound as a form of sense in literary writing, and the pataphysical operations of modern art and its strange figures of subjective dissolution. Over the course of this weekend, I'm sure that we'll approach the topic of sophistry from many different discrepant angles. But by way of introduction, all I ask is that if you find yourself eating a pastry and wandering through the city over the weekend, pondering the being or the non-being of that which is not, as lost in thought and as late for a symposium as Socrates once was, that you'll neither forget nor remember to absentmindedly drop a wrapper on the street for the bakery girl of Monceau. So again, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to Mama and to Zagreb, uh, and I'm thrilled to see so many good friends here after the interval of a year. So thanks to all our speakers for coming this weekend. <laughs>